Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Schmidt, a Senior Policy Analyst on the Child Care and Early Education team at the Center for Law and Social Policy, or CLASP. I have the pleasure of being joined today by Elizabeth Wright Burek, who is the Senior Program Director at Georgetown University's Center for Children and Families, or CCF. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi. We would like to welcome you all to CLASP and CCF's webinar titled Threats to the ACA and Medicaid, What's at Stake for Children? CLASP is a nonprofit anti-poverty organization that advocates for public policies that reduce poverty, improve the lives of poor people, and create ladders to economic security for all, regardless of race, gender, or geography. We target large-scale opportunities to reform federal and state programs, funding, and service systems, then work on the ground for effective implementation. CCF is an independent, nonpartisan policy and research center founded in 2005 with a mission to expand and improve high quality, affordable health coverage for America's children and families. Georgetown CCF provides research, develops strategies, and offers solutions to improve the health of America's children and families, particularly those with low and moderate incomes. In particular, CCF examines federal and state policies in Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program, or CHIP and the Affordable Care Act. Before we begin, I would like to quickly mention some housekeeping items regarding what you can expect over the duration of this webinar, which will be one hour. As you joined the webinar, your phone lines were automatically muted and will remain muted for the duration of this webinar. We'll save time at the end of this webinar to take some questions from the audience. To submit your questions throughout the webinar, please send them in via the chat box or question function in the bottom right corner of your webinar screen. You can also let us know about technical issues you're experiencing through the chat box. The presentation and recording will be available after the webinar on both of our websites at www.class.org and www.ccf.georgetown.edu. Next slide. Access to healthcare is a basic ingredient for children's healthy development and well-being. Children need medical care to support their physical, cognitive, and emotional development. Also enormously critical to child well-being is the well-being of their parents. When parents have access to health care for themselves and are able to receive treatment for physical and mental health needs, barriers to effective parenting caused by health concerns are removed. Prior to passage of the Affordable Care Act, or the ACA, many low-income parents lacked access to affordable health coverage because they were not offered or could not afford private insurance and were also not eligible for Medicaid. Historic gains in health coverage over the past three years are a result of provisions of the ACA that allowed many parents to be covered for the first time. Efforts to roll back the ACA, which Elizabeth will go into more detail in in just a little while, threaten the historic gains in ensuring low-income parents, as well as the record high rate of insurance among children. Losing ground on these gains would have devastating consequences for child well-being. Next slide. Today we're planning to talk about why the ACA and Ma Medicare Medicaid matters so much for early childhood and how we as early childhood advocates and people who care deeply about children and their families can fight back against the threats to these programs. We'll talk about the impact that the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid have had on children, their parents, and on child care providers, and how access to coverage and to services is so critically important. We will talk about the role of Medicaid and specifically Medicaid expansion. We'll also provide information on how financing of the programs works and what the potential threats may be. We will then talk about what we can do to fight back. We will, of course, save some time for questions at the end of this presentation. As a reminder, if you have questions, please submit them in the chat box or question function. Next slide. First, let's talk about affordable health care coverage, who has access to it, and why it's so important. Next slide. As early childhood advocates, we often focus on the child first, and for very good reason. We are used to thinking about health coverage, health care, and well-being in terms of children. And of course, we all know that children with health insurance are generally healthier and more likely to get treatment when they're sick, get regular treatment for recurring illnesses such as ear infections and asthma, and also more likely to have appropriate preventive care, including on-schedule immunizations and comprehensive screenings. I wanted to point out at the outset that, in fact, one of the great public policy successes in recent years was expanded health insurance coverage for children through CHIP, but even more co children gained health insurance coverage since the implementation of the ACA. Most young children today have health insurance, and more than 45 million of those children access health insurance through Medicaid and CHIP. 
To be sure, there are issues with access to appropriate treatment, but it's important to recognize that public health insurance plays a critical role for children, and the ACA offered the first time that many of their parents, um, who are the parents of low-income children, were eligible for coverage. Next slide. In states that took up the Medicaid expansion, many low-income parents had the opportunity to access Medicaid coverage or subsidized coverage through the exchanges for the first time. Prior to the ACA, more than a third of parents did not have health care coverage. Fortunately, many of these parents have access to health insurance now. But in addition to not having coverage, a lot of parents had a need for the coverage and a need to access to quality health insurance. And much of the research showed that prior to the ACA, parents were not in good health overall. For example, prior to the ACA, only 40% of parents reported good or excellent health. And maternal depression is a good example of this. Prior, research prior to the enactment of the ACA showed that 20% of mothers experienced major depression in the past 12 months and 46% in their lifetimes. Healthcare coverage is important for parents to be able to access necessary physical and mental health screenings and subsequent access to treatment when necessary. And while this is important for individuals' health, it is often underappreciated how important this is for children's health and well-being as well. Next slide. Children do better when their parents and other caregivers are healthy emotionally and physically. Adults' access to health care supports effective parenting, while untreated physical and mental health needs can get in the way. For example, a mother's untreated depression can place at risk her children's safety, development, and learning. Untreated chronic illnesses or pain can contribute to high levels of parental stress that are particularly harmful for children during the earliest years. Parents are crucial to children's healthy development and to families' ability to move out of poverty, which all of you know well. The first few years of a child's life are critically important to ensure their healthy development, and to ensure this, children need stability, coupled with responsive, nurturing relationships. As such, parenting deeply affects children's development. Parental stress, health and mental health, as well as parental education, affect parenting. This is why access to health care for parents is so important. Additionally, health insurance covers allows the whole family greater financial stability as the burdens of unexpected health problems and related costs are lifted. High health care costs contribute to economic insecurity, sometimes forcing families to choose between paying medical bills or paying for other basic necessities. Next slide. Children do not spend all of their time with their parents, though, making the role of other caregivers incredibly important, too. Throughout childhood, positive relationships with caregivers, in addition to parents, can mitigate the negative effects of trauma or adverse childhood experiences, including poverty. In states that took up Medicaid expansion, most all child care providers became eligible for health insurance, either through Medicaid or through state exchanges. Most low-wage workers previously were unable to access employer-sponsored insurance and could not afford premiums when offered. Now, many of these caregivers are covered. Next slide. Affordable health insurance makes it more likely that children and adults access health care, including preventive and well-child visits. The Kaiser Family Foundation's recent review of the research finds that coverage whether through Medicaid or private insurance, is associated with improvements in healthcare access 
mental health services. 31 states in D.C. extend Medicaid coverage to parents and other adults with incomes up to 138% of federal poverty. And three states, Alaska, D.C., and Connecticut, extend eligibility for parents to higher income levels. New research indicates that Medicaid expansion has not only resulted in improved access to medical benefits, but has also resulted in improved access to behavioral health treatment for newly eligible enrollees. A recent report on Ohio's expansion demonstrates that mental health care, including treatment for depression, is accessible to far more low-income parents than in the past. And now I'll turn it over to Elizabeth to talk about where things are right now and potential threats. As a reminder, if you have questions, please submit them in the chat box or in the questions box at the bottom of your screen. Elizabeth? Thanks. And can we go to the next slide? Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Very helpful overview of sort of why health coverage is so important, particularly to the low-income kids and families that we're talking about today. So I'm going to give a sense of where we are with children and family coverage right now. Um, the role of Medicaid, CHIP, and the Affordable Care Act, and then um, just try to give, to unpack some of the various federal proposals on the table and what they mean for children, particularly young children and their families. So next slide. So Stephanie mentioned we are at our highest rates of coverage for, for kids on record, um, seen here in the decline in the rate of uninsured children. Um, this is just since 2008, we're under 5% nationally in the rate of uninsured children. If you were to go back um, to the late 80s and 90s, it would be closer to 15%, more like 13 and 14%. Um, in the 90s, 80s and 90s, many states expanded Medicaid to higher income levels for children. So we saw more kids getting Medicaid coverage. Of course, in 1997, the Children's Health Insurance Program accelerated coverage gains for kids. And then, as Stephanie mentioned, in the Affordable Care Act, when it went into effect in 2014, not only got more kids that weren't eligible for Medicaid and CHIP access to coverage through marketplaces, um, but as their parents got coverage, more kids who were already eligible for Medicaid and CHIP were also enrolled. There was sort of a new culture of coverage that came with the Affordable Care Act, this expectation that everyone had coverage, and the majority of uninsured kids today are already eligible for Medicaid or CHIP, but they aren't enrolled or they've fallen off, and as their parents came in the door, they also Many of them signed up for coverage, and we often call that the welcome mat effect. So that continued decline you see between 2013 and 2015 as parents gained coverage, that was a really important um, direct impact on kids' coverage as well. Next slide. So, of course, parent coverage and coverage for all adults, um, whether or not they have dependent children, has improved also at our lowest rates of uninsured adults on record. Um, and you'll see, again, with the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, as many parents and caregivers had access to insurance either through the Medicaid expansion in states that took it or through the new marketplaces, we saw a really steep decline in their rate of uninsurance. Next slide. So I'm going to focus a little bit on kids, especially to set the stage for Medicaid. So First, this is just a snapshot of how kids are covered in terms of all income levels. And you see the majority of them are in employer-sponsored insurance with their families. Um, but more than a third, regardless of income, are in Medicaid or CHIP. If you were to look at this same pie chart just for low-income kids, so just under two times the poverty line, about $40,000 for a family of three, um, that 35% would jump to more than two-thirds of kids in Medicaid and CHIP. So it's Medicaid and CHIP are critical coverage sources for low-income kids especially. Next slide. When we look at young children, so kids under the age of six, of all incomes, nearly half um, are in Medicaid and CHIP. Um, and if you look at low-income kids, um, about two times the poverty line, that goes up to about three-fourths of kids under age six who are in Medicaid and CHIP. So critical sources for very young children um, in our country. Next slide. Of course, um, states have a lot of decisions they can make about eligibility for kids and parents and families, as Stephanie alluded to. And for kids, the, the percentage of kids in each state under age six in Medicaid or CHIP varies by state based on some of these decisions and how they've gotten kids enrolled. So you'll see um, that the majority of states are anywhere from one-third to one-half of, ki of kids under age six in Medicaid or CHIP. 
a number of states over 50 percent, um, and most states at least are almost a quarter of um, young children who are in Medicaid or CHIP today. Next slide. Stephanie mentioned this as well, and I'm sorry the label somehow did not track as well, but if you look at the yellow side of the, of the screen, that is the number of children um, in Medicaid. If you look at all the folks on Medicaid in a snapshot in this country, the majority of 51% of kids um, or of Medicaid beneficiaries or children. And this is something most people don't know. We don't typically think of kids as the primary or the biggest group of Medicaid beneficiaries. We typically think of seniors or disabled adults or the new adults that have just become eligible. But kids rely very heavily on this program. Um, and they cost actually very little compared to other populations. Uh, just as a quick plug, all of the slides I just went through and some ones I have coming um, where I look at the portion of kids on Medicaid and CHIP and um, kids under age six, we just put out some state snapshots of health coverage for kids with the um, American Academy of Pediatrics. We have a link to the slide at the end of this presentation. So if you're interested for these proportions for your state, um, we can certainly get those to you or you can check that link out. Next slide. So this is an early childhood community, so I will say I know you all are very steeped in um, long-term and longitudinal research for young children, um, and we are thrilled that in the Medicaid space we also, um, as of the last few years, have some great um, long-term outcome studies and longitudinal studies of kids who received Medicaid and the impacts on those children as adults. So I mentioned, oh, let's, let's go back one more, okay, thanks. So this shows really that Medicaid is not just an incredible foundational source of health coverage for kids, um, but also makes them healthy and more productive adults, and Medicaid can contribute to their own economic mobility. Um, so I mentioned that many states in the 80s and 90s were starting to expand Medicaid to kids at higher income levels, which gave economists and researchers an ability to look at kids who had access um, to Medicaid expansion and those who didn't in states that might not have. And they did some sort of modeling to see what the effect on those kids was as they became adults. Um, and really, it not only was important and it made them healthier as adults, but it also made them less likely to drop out of high school, more likely to complete college. And some of the scale of the educational outcomes coming out of some of the studies appears to have the same level of impact as some of the education-specific interventions we see, such as smaller class sizes. I mean, this makes sense, of course, because, you know, kids, when they're sick or they don't have access to health care, can't come to school ready to learn or they don't get to school and they're sick. So it makes logical sense, but it's nice to have some studies to back this up for folks as we... So it does, and these are just two aspects. Um, I will note, we um, summarized a lot of these different studies um, a few years ago in a paper we did that's cited here. Um, we are in the process of updating that because new studies have come out in the last few, last year or so, so we are going to have that available in the next few weeks as well on our website. So stay tuned. Next slide. Okay, so hopefully we've convinced you, if you weren't already convinced, how valuable Medicaid and CHIP are for kids. Um, but I wanted to first talk a little bit more about their history and structure, um, partially because it's hard to unpack the proposals on the table um, for Medicaid without sort of understanding what the current structure looks like and what's in place today. So Medicaid is more than 50 years old now. Um, it was created as a companion to Medicare, which of course is a <clears throat> program for Seniors, healthcare program for seniors. Unlike Medicare, Medicaid is a state federal partnership. So the federal government um, sets some broad parameters and requirements 
um, four states, and this, and, and when it was first conceived, they had to cover children and parents who were on AFDC or welfare. They had to cover um, seniors and folks with disabilities, and then there are optional things that the states could do after that, like covering adults and others. Um, it is permanently authorized, and it's an entitlement. Um, so that means Congress doesn't have to come back and refund it. It is continually funded, um, and the federal government sends a match to states, they pay for a portion of all the cost of anyone who's eligible for Medicaid in that state based on how the state's determined eligibility. And the federal government, depending on the state, pays anywhere from 50 to 75 percent of the benefit cost with no cap. So as, any, as long as anyone's eligible, they come into the program, they need health care, um, the government is going to pay, the federal government will pay the state to pay 50 to 75 percent of the share of that cost. And the state will pick up the remaining 25 to 50 percent. There is no cap. It is, it is a guaranteed funding stream um, and has been for 50 years. States administer the program and they can determine, as I mentioned, things like income eligibility, benefits to some degree with, uh, above some federal minimums, cost sharing, so whether families and kids have to pay um, co-pays or premiums within some limits. There are some really good cost sharing protections in Medicaid. And states also determine provider payments um, in Medicaid and CHIP. So, Next slide. So the Children's Health Insurance Program, as I mentioned, was created in 1997. Um, and it was created, as I mentioned, many states were already extending Medicaid to children at higher income levels. And this was really an opportunity to get more states to cover uninsured kids. Um, unlike Medicaid, um, CHIP is a block grant with capped annual allotments to states. So while the state, as you can see, kicks in, or the federal government kicks in actually at a higher matching rate than Medicaid, for anywhere from 65 to 85 percent, depending on the state. And by the way, these matching rates are based on state um, per capita income. So if you're a poor state, you have a higher federal match. So the federal government pays a higher share per chip, but it's up to an annual allotment. So, this, so every two years, based on chip spending, um, the federal government says, here is your block grant, here's your allotment, your federal allotment for the state. We are going to pay your matching rate, 85% for that state, um, up to your cap. But once the federal cap is reached, there's no more federal money available to fund those kids. So then states have to determine whether they kick in state money to cover those federal dollars or whether they have to turn kids and uh, other folks away. So again, states administer this program. They have a lot of flexibility and, in fact, more flexibility than Medicaid about what the design and the what the benefits look like, cost sharing and payments and that kind of thing. Uh, we like to say that CHIP stands on the shoulders of Medicaid. It was really built on Medicaid to um, extend coverage to more kids. It is by far, it's much smaller, as you'll see in the next slide, than Medicaid, but um, the other piece of because it's not an entitlement like Medicaid, Congress has to come back and refund it every few years. So that's part of being a block grant, too, is you have to come back and refund it. And what we know is that Met CHIP funding is going to be uh, expiring at the end of this September of this year. So Congress is in the middle of everything else going on. They have to come back and refund CHIP to continue this funding source and program for states. Um, one last thing I'll say is that states in their design of CHIP had a decision to make when CHIP was created whether they wanted to extend Medicaid eligibility and just reimburse themselves at the CHIP matching rate, which many do, um, or whether they created separate CHIP programs um, and I, and, or some combination of that. Um, so next slide, I'll give you sort of a relative sense of the size of these programs. So you can see why we say CHIP stands on the shoulders of Medicaid. We often call Medicaid the MVP of children's coverage because the vast majority of children in public coverage are in Medicaid. And there's 37 million in traditional Medicaid. There are nearly 5 million in Medicaid that are funded by CHIP. So I mentioned many states extend CHIP Medicaid and reimburse themselves with CHIP. So in a sense, those, if you see the gray dot, those are kids in Medicaid that are just funded by CHIPS so the state gets more money for those kids. Of course, about 4 million kids are in separate CHIP programs. And if you look at the marketplace, of course, the marketplace, um, most kids were already in Medicaid or eligible for Medicaid or CHIP, so it wasn't as huge when the ACA came about. But about a million kids did get coverage in the marketplace that couldn't get into Medicaid and CHIP before. But Medicaid really is the, the big kahuna for kids in our country. Next slide. So not only is Medicaid a critical resource for kids, 
Um, it is also a key player in state budgets. It is the largest single source of federal funds going into states, um, eclipsing all other, all other federal sources. So Medicaid is well over half going into each state, um, and that's more than all of the other federal funding sources going into states combined. Next slide. So that was my base setting to give you a sense of what's going on today. Um, and now on to sort of the current dialogue about the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid changes. Next slide. So the ACA was designed largely, as we said, to extend coverage to adults because kids had Medicaid and CHIP. But there were several provisions that directly impacted kids um, that we wanted to lay out that, that are at risk if the ACA is repealed, particularly if we look at the last repeal from last year that was vetoed by President Obama about a year ago. That's the best model we have to sort of look at at this point. So of course, as we've mentioned, many millions of parents would lose coverage they just gained, either through the Medicaid expansion or marketplaces. And as Stephanie already mentioned, that impacts not only their health, but also economic security of families, and that welcome mat I mentioned, and many kids who came in the door with their parents to get coverage. Um, the ACA also has a specific provision for former foster youth. So the ACA allowed, you probably have heard or knew, that the ACA allowed um, children to stay on their parents' employer-sponsored plans up through age 26. And it had a companion provision for foster care children that said foster care kids could stay on Medicaid up through age 26 uh, because essentially Medicaid was their parent, if you will, in the foster care system. Um, so that's been a really incredible source of uh, health coverage for kids who are aging out of the foster care system. Um, the ACA also had what's called as a maintenance of effort requirement through 2019. Basically what happened with the ACA is lawmakers said kids coverage is working, we have Medicaid and CHIP, they've been successful. So it basically said states cannot roll back their eligibility, they can't add more red tape to the enrollment process for families and make it harder for them to get coverage at least through 2019, and then we'll see where we are in the health world. Um, and so states are not allowed to roll back what's there for kids, at least through 2019, and that is something that has been floated to remove um, in the repeal bill as well. And of course, I mentioned there were a million kids who gained marketplace coverage, and marketplaces uh, go away in the repeal, those kids lose that source of coverage. Next slide. So in terms of the impact of the bill we mentioned that was vetoed last year. The Urban Institute did some great analysis on what it would mean for kids and families. And I should say this is just ACA repeal, which is repeal of the Medicaid expansion to adults, um, taking away the marketplaces and the provisions I just mentioned. It, has, it hasn't even touched Medicaid yet. We're getting there. But just the repeal alone would more than uh, double the number and the percentage of uninsured kids. It would also more than double the number of percentage of uninsured parents. Um, if you And, and many of these, as part of the replacement conversation, effort to, we would say, radically restructure Medicaid as we know it today. Um, so while ACA repeal and replace is all over the news, including repeal of the Medicaid expansion to adults, what's not as clear but we think has huge implications are these efforts to radically restructure Medicaid financing. Um, it would basically restructure a program that's worked for more than 50 years to provide health coverage during every economic downturn, health crisis, and natural disaster. Um, and ultimately, I'll go through what the proposals are here, but ultimately what these proposals do is cap the money that the federal government would send to states, either in the short or the long term. Um, these are not new, this question of block grants or per capita caps. Um, the latest uh, Republican plan released uh, by the speaker last week would give states the option to choose between block grants and per capita caps. Um, they've been attempted before. We have an idea of what the impact would be based on friends at the Center on Budget and others who have done analyses of these. Um, both are caps to met federal Medicaid 
funding, and their design is really to save the federal government money. I, I will repeat that many times because what that means is there's a cost shift to states, and states have to make up the difference. So let me break it down a little bit. So block grants, um, as you see with CHIP, would set a specific allotment for every state. And then based on their enrollment today, let's say they took this year's spending, and then um, once the state reached that federal cap, they would have no more federal money. So if enrollment went up, there was an economic downturn, more folks needed Medicaid coverage, um, that guarantee of coverage would not be there. It would no longer be an entitlement. Um, and that means that costs would either, the state would either have to cut eligibility or benefits or others, um, or turn people away from coverage. It removes, what we like to say about block grants is it removes the guarantee of coverage you, what they have in Medicaid today. Now, per capita cap um, would set a, a reimbursement amount from the federal government per, per beneficiary. So proposals will typically say we're going to divide the Medicaid population into seniors and children and adults and parents and, you know, or however they do it and have a reimbursement rate. Um, a federal reimbursement for each category. So it, it takes away um, enrollment changes. So it would still get reimbursed for enrollment changes for each of these beneficiaries, but what it would not account for, um, because it's still a cap, would be other health costs that rise. So for example, if there are new treatment available, um, hepatitis C is one, or new autism treatment becomes available, as those costs rise, the federal uh, share would not keep up, or if EpiPens um, were needed for kids and the cost of EpiPens went up, that would not be accounted for in per capita cap. Um, we talk about this a lot because there, the health costs, oftentimes states can't plan for epidemics that come up, like HIV in the 80s is a huge epidemic, and Medicaid played a huge role to help um, treat folks with HIV and AIDS. Um, the Zika virus recently, Medicaid was an important federal partner to states who were battling that. Those are the kinds of things that impact health costs that you just can't anticipate, um, but aren't just about enrollment. Next slide. So this is sort of a, a slide that the Center on Budget put together that we think is helpful to show what's going on. So on the left side of the slide, it shows a, a state that has a 60% federal match, and of course, the, stick, the, the dark blue is the federal government share. The state kicks in 40 of that $100. If spending goes up um, on the right hand, on the left hand, right hand bar, <laughs> if spending goes up, the, the uh, federal share goes up, um, even, and the state share goes up too, but basically the pr propor proportional increases in the federal and state share. The proposals to cap Medicaid funding, um, essentially, as you can see on the right hand side, once you've hit the federal cap, whether it's your capita cap or a block grant, the money runs out and that state has to pick up um, the extra cost in the light blue. So really, we, all, we say all the time, this is a cost shift to states and states have to make then the hard decisions of who and what to cut and what that means. And again, it, it doesn't help with unanticipated costs due to enrollment changes or health costs that come up. Next slide. So I mentioned that CHIP is a block grant. So one of the things that we hear often is, well, CHIP has been so successful for kids, and it has, why is CHIP not a model for a Medicaid block grant? Well, here is one reason. Um, CHIP, as I mentioned, has to be refunded every few years and reauthorized. And you'll see that blip, this is uninsured kids um, since back in 1996 or so. If you see 2005, 2006, that is when states were hitting their federal allotments in CHIP. And so they were having to turn kids away from health coverage in CHIP. And that's when you saw that increase in the uninsured rate for kids go up before it was reauthorized in 2009. Um, so that, that as I, we say, block grants really remove that guarantee of coverage as states hit that allotment. Um, and so, and not to mention CHIP, um, especially in 2009, there were many contingencies built into CHIP to make sure states didn't run out of money and could continue. Um, to pull from other sources and do things to keep kids enrolled. Um, and CHIP is a much more homogeneous population than Medicaid. As, you know, Medicaid is kids, but it's also seniors and adults and others who have different health needs, much different and harder to anticipate what some of those health costs are going to be for such a heterogeneous population in Medicaid, and a much larger program for that matter. Next slide. So many of the proposals we hear about restructuring Medicaid or changing Medicaid or putting Medicaid in a budget, they say that, you know, they, they're about capping, as I mentioned, 
Um, but what they, what often they're touted at is we're going to give states more flexibility in their Medicaid programs to do what they can for their own population. Um, we see this as a red herring, partially because of the magnitude of the cuts um, that the federal government would be looking at. If it's, it's state flexibility to do, to make cuts potentially, because you're doing, you can't do more with less. Um, and so what that flexibility really looks like is enrollment caps or turning folks away from eligibility, uh, more red tape in the enrollment process, asking for more, really trying to do things that are more indirect and not as, as um, impactful, maybe asking for um, more requirements or checking incomes more often, um, barriers and red tape that make it harder for folks to get in the programs and stay in the programs and end up um, costing them less. They could cut benefits. Um, and they could increase premiums and cost sharing and co-pays on kids and families. That's the kind of flexibility the states would have. I mean, I think we all, uh, and I should say, Medicaid has a lot of flexibility built in today. A lot of states have been doing more with social determinants of health and paying for other kinds of programs like home visiting and other things that early childhood folks care about. Um, those, those are already things you can do, harder to do with less money. And so I think that, um, while it is a very promising concept, um, we think it's a little bit of a, uh, not the full picture in terms of what states would be able to do. Next slide. So I just want to bring out one specific piece of Medicaid that is at risk that's specific to children. Um, Medicaid has a benefit protection for children called EPSDT, Early Periodic Screening Diagnostic and Treatment. This is the core benefits package for children in Medicaid. It goes beyond what anyone else in Medicaid receives. It says that states have to cover all appropriate and, quote, medically necessary services to correct and ameliorate health conditions. This is regardless of whether the state has put it in its state plan. Um, this, and so, and so it's already, you know, states already, I will say, don't always love EPSDT, but it's important because it, it gives states the, doctors in particular and others the flexibility to make sure kids get what they need and what they determine is medically necessary for their growth and development. Um, of course, spending caps would make it much harder for states to meet this requirement. But we also know that some of the proposals on the table in the past would actually add new state flexibility that would, in effect, remove this protection for kids. Um, and we think this is really a risk for children because EPSDT is such an important protection and it means that if states then have to cut more or have more discretion over what they fund for kids, that policymakers and politicians and not doctors are making decisions about what kids need to develop and grow. Um, and that is, is really troubling um, for in terms of the protection that kids have had, again, for, in this case, almost 50 years in Medicaid. Next slide. So that is, I'm happy to take questions because I know that's a lot of complicated policy wonky stuff. Um, so I appreciate your bearing with me. In terms of the timeline for these proposals, I'm sure you've seen the news, lots of discussion about ACA repeat. in the House as early, at least planned for at this point. Last week, it was supposed to be this week, but there's a hearing in the, or a, a markup in the Energy and Commerce Committee in the House. Again, these timelines keep slipping. There is no consensus at this point within the House, much less across the House and Senate. Um, and I think that's a lot of it because states and, and governors were here this week with the National Governors Association, a lot of concern by states that indeed these would be proposals that cap Medicaid and send a lot of that funding to states. Um, and have them having to make the hard decisions instead of Congress about what to do. Um, so it's still kind of up in the air. Lots of leaked documents, a lot of, you know, a lot of chaos, not clear what the plan is, um, but definitely on the table and a high priority for many people. Um, I mentioned, you know, CHIP fits in here somewhere. There's no new CHIP funding um, after September. It's unclear where it's going to fit in. I think that, you know, states already need to start thinking about what they do if CHIP funding doesn't continue. Um, 
the National Academy of State Health Policy put out a report last week that showed most states are banking on CHIP being extended, funding being extended, including the extra money they've gotten um, in the last extension. Um, I think that it would be smart, if you were asking my opinion, for Congress to go ahead and extend CHIP, get it out of the way, don't make any structural changes, and then move on to the rest. But it would be a win, a bipartisan win, just like CHIP was back in 97. But in any case, it's hard to know. There are always rumors about whether CHIP will be wrapped into these replacement efforts and to Medicaid changes or whether it will stand on its own. I will say, in terms of the timeline, CHIP is on the same timeline for expiration as um, home visiting funding or McVie. So if it does ride by itself or ride in another package, it's possible that it could ride with efforts to extend home visiting funding. So we will see uh, where that goes. But still a lot that's unclear, and the timelines keep sticking or slipping. Excuse me. Next slide. So to sum up, um, Stephanie and I did a blog that I think is on both of our websites right now um, in terms of threats for particularly young children, but all children. Um, these efforts to repeal the ACA Medicaid caps in terms of the upshot, millions of children, parents, and caregivers would lose health coverage, certainly with repeal, definitely with Medicaid cuts. Um, with the Medicaid caps, there would be no coverage guarantee in Medicaid. It would not be an entitlement anymore. States could, if they start to run out of money, turn kids and families away. Um, really think that the children's benefit protections in Medicaid are at risk. Um, states could also pass on um, the cost of care and coverage to families and kids, even if they stay in Medicaid. Um, and then last but not least, you know, all of this is added pressure on state budgets and a lot of the other programs that we care about for kids and families. And if states are having to pick up more of the costs in health care, um, then that means they might have to make difficult choices about other places to cut. It's just, again, less, uh, less of the pie. So it, it's just we think that's also an important piece of this is what it means for state budget conversations as well as states get less money. And with that, I will turn it back over to Stephanie. Thanks, Elizabeth. That was all incredibly helpful. And I'm sure there are many questions out there seeking um, clarification on some of the um, more complicated pieces mm -hmm. that you had talked about. And we'll get to questions in just a moment. So if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them um, using the question box at the bottom right corner of your screen. Um, so um, if we can go to the next slide, um, I know uh, you all are probably just as eager as I am to know about what you can do to fight back after hearing everything Elizabeth had to share about the potential threats to um, children and parents' health coverage. So let's talk um, very briefly about what you can do as an advocate and a stakeholder. Let's go to the next slide. Um, child care and early education advocates, stakeholders, and providers really play a critical role in ensuring that children have access to vital supports, including um, health care. As providers, you have unique insights into family situations and often know well when they don't have the resources that they need. And as advocates and stakeholders, you really care deeply about ensuring that the needs of children and their families are met. Uh, repeal of the ACA and threats to Medicaid are topics that we're hearing about daily and things are changing rapidly as Elizabeth highlighted. Fortunately, there really are many things that we can do to fight back against these potentially harmful threats. So the first thing that you can do is to contact your senators, representatives, and governors and let them know that they should focus on making healthcare more affordable and accessible and not jeopardizing coverage for children and families. To find your senator's contact information, you can go to www.senate.gov. To find your representative's contact information, you can go to www.house.gov. And to find your governor's contact information, you can go to www.usa.gov backslash state dash governor. Once you find your contact information for the senator, representative, or governor that represents you, um, you can call their office and talk to them about what it would mean um, to repeal ACA or change the structure of Medicaid and what is at stake for children and families. You can tell them that on ACA repeal, you don't want to see the ACA repealed or, roll, or any rollback of the ACA or Medicaid expansion. And on Medicaid, you can tell them that you want the current structure maintained with no block grants or per capita caps, um, which you now understand, as Elizabeth explained them. This is really also a great opportunity to tell a story. You can tell your story if you have one related to the access to care that you've received as a result of the ACA or Medicaid, or tell the stories of families that you know or serve. 
getting stories out there by telling them to your representatives or senators or sharing them with your state or local child advocacy or health consumer advocacy group or getting them published in a newspaper or sharing them by social media are really helpful ways to get information out there and to make the case for why these programs are so important for children and families. I imagine that a lot of you are already connected to your state and local child advocacy groups. But connecting yourself and your child advocacy groups to health and health consumer advocacy groups in your state who likely already have efforts underway can be a very productive way to contribute as well. If you don't know what that group might be, you can feel free to reach out to Elizabeth or I and we can help to connect you to the right group in your state. And finally, as you already well know, and as Elizabeth highlighted, things are constantly changing. It seems like there's a new idea or proposal coming out every day. So, Staying up to date is very important and getting the latest information is very important as well. You can connect to both CLASP and CCF by joining our mailing list. Um, we have our contact information on the last slide of this um, webinar, which we'll get to shortly, but you can feel free to reach out to either of us if you need help getting connected to our organizations and getting updates as well. Next slide. And so with that, we can turn um, to questions for the remainder of the time that we have left on the webinar. Um, as I mentioned, if you have any questions, please submit them in the chat box in the bottom right corner. Um, so one question that we've gotten frequently um, over the duration of the webinar is whether the presentation will be available online. Uh, the presentation um, and the webinar recording will be available on both of our websites very soon after the presentation is over. I think we'll actually email it out to the registrants um, tomorrow. So if you missed uh, a portion of the webinar you want to share it, you'll be able to do that as early as tomorrow. Um, the next question, Elizabeth, is for you. Um, someone wanted to know about whether undocumented children are counted in the coverage rates that you highlight at the beginning of your presentation. Um, and if they are, or if they aren't, does that mean that the 4.8% of uninsured children is a little bit overstated? I forgot to get into my knowledge of census data. I do think that that um, does include them, um, in part because that is sort of U.S. Census uh, data through the American Community Survey. Um, some of the other pieces in terms of uh, health coverage that I had earlier earlier wouldn't because many of them aren't eligible, but it would include, is my understanding, undocumented immigrants. Great. And there's um, another specific question about your presentation. Someone was wondering if you might be able to restate what you said about foster care youth's mm -hmm. access to, um, to health insurance um, sure. on slide 26. <laughs> sure, slide 26. So the ACA had a, um, a provision specifically for kids who age out of the foster care system. Um, and typically kids can stay on Medicaid or kids in foster care can stay on Medicaid um, through, through age 18 through 19. Um, the provision in the Affordable Care Act said kids who age out of the foster care system can stay in Medicaid um, through age 26. Um, and so it allowed that additional health care coverage for kids as they were transitioning into adulthood. Wonderful. And that is, of course, it's also on the table and repeal potentially, which mm -hmm. is why we brought it up front. Up front. Mm -hmm. structured. That's why we keep saying this is an effort to radically restructure how Medicaid works, because even if we don't see those threats 
immediately if the federal share is going down over time, which is what these proposals are designed to do, eventually states are going to hit that cap and then are forced to make decisions. So I think it's not as immediate as the ACA repeal, but we certainly think it would be a fundamental shift and threat um, for the short and, and certainly the long-term coverage for kids and families. Great. Um, and another question um, about the uh, threats that you highlighted. So someone wanted to know a little bit more about the threats that you mentioned specifically um, related to restructuring Medicaid. Mm -hmm. They said, I know what a block grant is, but I don't really understand the per capita cap still. How is it different than a block grant? Mm -hmm. So a block grant gives you a, a, a grant, an annual um, grant for a state that once you hit that and you can, states have all the flexibility to use that grant however they want to, to provide coverage for their residents, and then once they hit that federal share, the state has to kick in for dollars. And so that means if enrollment changes under a block grant, um, that doesn't matter. You have, less, you have less money to pay even if enrollment goes up in Medicaid. The per capita cap takes the enrollment changes off the table, if you will. So while the guarantee of coverage is off the, it, it is not guaranteed in a block grant, you might still have a guarantee of coverage in a per capita cap. So it tries to account for enrollment changes by saying, we're going to give you a federal share per enrollee cost. So if a, I'm making this up, if a child is $2,000 a year and maybe the, the federal government will pay 1000 of that, um, we'll pay you 1000 from here on out. You know, we might have it in, adjusted for inflation, but we're going to give you that. And if, so what it does is it adjusts for enrollment changes. So if enrollment goes up, you're still going to get that per person reimbursement from the federal government. What it will not do is account for health cost changes. So as I mentioned, if you have EpiPen costs for kids or if you have new autism treatments or other kinds of things that cost more per capita caps, Still, or a federal cap, it's just a line designed a little differently. It's a little trickier to explain, as you can tell from my trying to do it, but it's still a cap. It just, it doesn't remove the guarantee of coverage, but it does remove the guarantee of comprehensive benefits, if that makes sense. Great. Um, there are a number of different questions um, coming through in different formats regarding um, talking points about Medicaid and CHIP to be able to use in um, reaching out to representatives and senators, mm -hmm. either on the local level, state level, or the national level, um, and also about inside messaging versus mm -hmm. outside messaging. And so um, I just wanted to mention a couple of things, and, and if you want to mention anything too, Elizabeth, um, there's a large effort um, at the national level um, called Protect Our Care. Um, it's a coalition of a lot of um, national organizations who are coming together who have done a lot of work about bringing together um, all kinds of different messaging to reach different um, folks. And we can definitely connect anyone who is interested to that information and also share um, information that we have um, on that front as well. I don't know if you want to add anything to that as well, Elizabeth. Well, sure. I mean, I would say, um, you know, part of this, certainly there are asks and talking points about let's not mess with Medicaid or let's not mess with ACA. I do think, especially when it comes to Medicaid, there's still so much education to do about the role it plays for kids. Um, I mentioned those state-by-state -state fact sheets we did with the AAP. You know, there are some, just even telling the story of who Medicaid serves and what it does right now is critically important. And then sort of the question being, how are you going to make sure that Medicaid uh, changes don't disrupt this success for kids, or how do we make sure that these changes don't upend um, this resource that kids and families have. Um, that said, there are other groups and lots of pleas, including those consumer and health advocacy groups in your states that are working on this. I am sure they have lots of talking points and materials, uh, and if not, we, we all should get together and make sure <laughs> they do. Um, because I know it's a very complicated story to tell. Um, but even if you don't feel like you have the exact talking points, just telling the story of who we're talking about that's being served by this program and telling those stories and showing that proportion, I think, is really important as well. Yeah, and to that point, um, if we could go to the next slide. And then the next slide after that, um, we wanted to make sure that you are connected to our resources as well. So we wanted to spend a few minutes showing you this um, slide that will give you the information that you um, that Elizabeth was talking about, and that could help you um, when you're um, doing your advocacy efforts on the on the state and national level as well. And I'll also just mention tomorrow, class will be re releasing another um, paper about children and parents' access and the importance of the access to health insurance as well. And we'll be sure to get that out to the group of registrants for this um, webinar, which absolutely can help in your advocacy efforts as well.
if you want to go ahead and go to the next slide. Unfortunately, we are um, running low on time for our webinar today, and we're sorry that we weren't able to get to all the questions that we received. We received a large number of questions, and we'll be sure to um, follow up on those questions um, very quickly with the folks who answered them and the larger group as well. So we'd like to thank you all so much for joining this webinar today, and we look forward to advocating for these important programs together with you moving forward. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon.